Good day. I'm Colonel Jerry Morlock, the director of the Combat Studies Institute. You're about to use a video series which our instructors have prepared for the sole purpose of improving your presentation of M610, The Evolution of Modern Warfare. We've taken care to make the course that you teach as similar to the one taught at Fort Leavenworth as possible and choose to add these tapes to your libraries in order to give you every advantage as you prepare to teach this new course. These tapes are similar to the weekly train-up sessions which we utilize to prepare our instructors here at Fort Leavenworth. My intent for the tape sessions was to provide you insights and tips on ways to approach the lessons of M610 that were not available in the instructor notes. I've drawn various instructors, military and civilian, into the sessions based upon their specific expertise and historical background. They were asked to just talk to the lesson structure and content, giving you some additional information on the historical context and differing views on how to approach the lessons. These tapes will provide you a wealth of knowledge and direction that will significantly improve your readiness to teach our new history course. One word of caution regarding how to use these training tapes. They are not designed to be substituted for your instruction during the individual lessons of the course. As instructor preparation tapes, train the training material, if you will, they are inappropriate for direct instruction to students and are not intended for that purpose. Our intent with these tapes is to improve your ability to lead the student seminars by sharing tips and advice from some highly qualified experts. The Combat Studies Institute stands ready to provide whatever additional expertise or assistance that you may require, and we've included the Institute's phone, mail, and email contact information on the tape if you should need it. Good luck with the Evolution of Modern Warfare course, and have a good time. Hello, I'm Lieutenant Colonel Scott Stevenson, uh, the course author for the resident version of the course that you're, you're uh, going to be pitching to your reserve students. Uh, with me today is my office mate, uh, esteemed colleague, Dr. George Gavrick, who, among other things, is our Middle East expert and a guy who is a no-kidding historian. Again, I'm the administrator of the course. He gives us our little session today, a little academic credibility. What we want to do is, is, is set the stage for you for, for teaching the first class of MS 610. Uh, the most important class you're going to teach, at least for this course, uh, one that will determine in a large part the success or failure of the course. And I say that because you're going to walk into a classroom where there are three kind of people, my thought. There are people who, who believe in history and you've got them sold. They're going to be with you no matter what you do. There's another group of people who, who won't see any relevance in this, won't see any value in it, and, I, and I'm afraid that there's not much you can do short of banging their heads against the desk. And then there's the, the third group and maybe the most important group, and those are the folks who come in with an open mind, not sure whether history is going to be relevant and important to them or not. And uh, those are the guys you want to reach. If you can hook them in lesson one, get them interested, uh, start to, to work on uh, showing them the relevance of what you're going to talk about in this course, then uh, you're a long way toward making the, your overall uh, efforts in this course to be successful. So what we want to do today is talk about what you might use, the approaches you might use, the, the kind of topics you might cover, maybe talk a little bit about uh, some background information that might be useful to you. George and I will do a little dialogue about the things we think are important. Each of us has a different approach. And that's one thing I want to encourage you is OK. Uh, what, don't go away from here telling, thinking, man, I've got to follow strictly what these guys have told me. We allow a lot of freedom of our instructors here in the department about how they pitch the course. And I encourage you to, to model what we say or, or or adapt what you see here, adapt what you read in the course, adapt what you see in the instructor's notes, your own personal style, your own background, uh, what you find interesting, and, and also uh, what, what you're getting from the students about what they're interested in. There's going to be a constant feedback mechanism going on in the classroom between uh, what, you, what you're giving to them, what, what they're receiving, and what they're interested in, and, and what you talk about. Uh, again, this, is, this course is intended here at CGSC to be a graduate level seminar. Uh, a lot of free ranging discussion guys bringing in their own experience guys trying to establish relevance between the issues of the past and what's going on uh, in the current military today. So I, again, you're going to have to adapt this thing to what you see works in the classroom for you. I see, and, and I'll ask you to, to comment on this, George, I, I, I see four things you've got to cover in this first lesson. 
number one, the administrative part. And that's the painful, uh, tedious, repetitious stuff. You know, this is how the course is conducted. This is how the course is graded. This is what I'll expect you to do to prepare. All those kind of things. That has got to take place, and you really can't give it short shrift in the first lesson. The administrative of, uh, of this particular course. The second thing is talk to them about military history in general. Uh, again, this goes back to what I was saying about putting a hook into them about, hey, why is this relevant? Why is this going to be useful to me? Third thing, and this is one of your learning objectives, is the relationship between military history, military theory, and military doctrine. The bulk of what they're going to get in your reserve or, uh, school is going to be doctrine. Uh, what military history d does for you, what our, this course ideally should do for you, is give you some insights on where doctrine comes from uh, and how history through theory feeds into it. And then the fourth thing is, is the readings. And the readings in this case talk about one of the, the first great captains of what we call modern warfare, Frederick the Great. I, I emphasize you, you're going to have to find some time, and you want to find some time in this first lesson to talk about Frederick the Great and what's discussed in these readings because if the students start to see that they're assigned readings that aren't covered, that aren't the subject of discussion, they're going to start blowing it off very early on. Uh, so you want to get to these readings right here. And, and there's some provocative things, some interesting things to talk about. Um, so anyway, so George, what I've laid out, uh, the, thing, the four things I think they have uh, to cover, uh, the administration, uh, the nature and value of military history, the relationship of history, theory, and doctrine, and then uh, the subject, the key subject of the readings for this go-around, and that's Fred the Great. Any thoughts about that? I agree with you wholeheartedly and no sense in belaboring that point. Go well, ahead. Well, thanks. Go ahead. Do it <laughs> I well. can tell he's going to be really useful today. Um, George, I, I, I don't want to. I don't want to spend any any excessive amount of time on the administration, but I do want to talk about the the value of military history. And uh, in your experience, uh, going into the classroom, how do you approach? How do you uh, go about getting that hook into into students that hey, this is something valuable and useful? First of all, I think you could approach the class and just ask the students, your officers, what do they think is the value of history? Why do greats like Frederick Napoleon, a famous person like Patton, place tremendous value on history? And see what kind of reaction you get from them. Because I think one of the purposes of this course is not just to impart information and, and give insights into the past, but to create a burning love for history or an appreciation of the value of history for the profession of arms. Now, what value does military history have for the professional officer is a thing that I think you have to come to grips with and really internalize the belief that it is tremendously valuable because that will then uh, influence the officers who come to your classes. They'll see that you believe in the subject, you think it's valuable, and they'll catch on in their hearts. If I was going to choose a profession out there in the real world that needs history, the military profession would certainly be near the top of the list, if not the first one. If you look at virtually every profession, people in that profession practice what they're supposed to do. Surgeons perform operations. Policemen drive on streets and patrol areas and deal with criminals. In the military profession, your job is to defend the country. And that requires being prepared to face death and destruction on the battlefield. How much time really in a 20-year career, 25-year career, does an officer, does a soldier actually experience combat? Rare indeed. The other problem that you have, even if you've had some combat experience and it's tremendously valuable, how far can you go with it? If you experience shooting at the platoon level, will that translate into direct relevance if you're now at a division in the rear 10 years later? Therefore, what you ex are experiencing in the profession of arms is really a lack of that fundamental experience of combat, even though your whole career is preparing to face combat. What, the mil what military history does is it gives you the experience of others who have faced death and destruction on the battlefield. To put the context of, of battle, uh, or put battle in a larger context, you get that from history. 
and I can think of one book by, uh, well, actually it's put together by uh, George C. Marshall called Infantry in Battle. And in there he puts into the introduction of that book that the purpose of history, of what he's doing, is to give the officer something of the viewpoint of the veteran. So by studying military history, you're gaining from the combat experience of others, putting it into your being, putting it into your memory bank. So when you do go face combat, or you prepare for combat, you have the experiences of years before you, of the past, to draw upon to make you a better professional well, let me officer. Challenge, let me challenge you on that, George. In this lesson, we're gonna talk about some armies getting together at some obscure places called Rosbach and Leuten, and what, what are now uh, Eastern Germany or uh, Poland. Uh, guys wearing powdered wigs firing muskets. Um, what possible use is that going to be to a modern guy who's going to be fighting with M1s and MLRSs and Bradleys and, and F-16s and all that other stuff? I mean, how can, how can they relate? How can that be of value to them, you think? It's interesting if you for example, look into next week's lesson when we have uh, the French Revolution, Napoleonic Warfare. You have what? Tremendous combat experience over uh, a span of a couple decades. And in there you have the great theorists come out, Germany and Clausewitz. And though they have a wealth of combat experience, as they're trying to come to grips with what is going on around them, they base a lot of their insights by going into the past. To, look, to study Frederick the Great, what we're going to look at today, to see what combat is about, not just around them, because you miss a lot of things about what, is, what makes combat go, what motivates people to fight, what seems to be transitory that's going to pass away, and what are the eternal principles, if you will, the fundamentals of, of combat, of leadership. You only get that by getting outside of your own experiences, getting outside of your own time frame, and looking to the others. And if you find, for the last 200 years, people have identified these are the important traits in leadership, no matter if they're from China, Germany, Poland, wherever, you start to realize that maybe there is this wealth of wisdom that we can draw upon, and I could emphasize these things as eternal. These things seem to be more American, things that maybe shouldn't be emphasized, and you only can get that by drawing upon the wealth and experience and wisdom of others, and history provides you with that. That's one thing I think that you could make a case from. And if you get to Frederick the Great, as you'll see today, there are a lot of things to learn about what made him a great leader. And those things are applicable today. And maybe some of those things we don't see in our leaders. We don't see to the same depth with Frederick. Be careful where you go now. And that, and that is valuable. And it helps to shape how you will perform in your own profession. Well, the, the thing I like to point out to my students, too, there's, there's a tendency among us to look at our most recent experience. Uh, for us, it's a Gulf War and peacekeeping missions in places like Somalia and Haiti. To, to say, hey, these are lessons of recent warfare. This is going to teach us about how to get ready for the next one. And the danger is that the experience, that experience is fairly narrow. And it also doesn't tell us where warfare has come from. One of the reasons, and I constantly harp on this throughout the school year, one of the reasons we, we uh, go so far back uh, in time is we want to show a record of change. Uh, we are advertising now that our military is going into the new millennium facing huge changes. We are advertising Force 21 and the Army Warfighting Experiment and the Army After Next. We're saying this, we're, we're embracing uh, what we're calling a military revolution. We're saying the battlefield that uh, junior officers today will face in the future is going to be vastly different from what has ever been seen before. Okay, change. I, I, you know, and I think your students will generally agree that we're seeing an enormous amount of change across, across society, and especially in military affairs. If that's true, how do people adapt to change? Massive, radical change. This is another place where going back and getting some perspective will help us. Uh, we can see change over the long term. We can see change happening in spurts. We can see technological change, economic change, social change, all affecting what goes on in the battlefield. And this is perspective I think the students badly need. 
uh, an ability to, to kind of reach back and say, okay, I've seen how people have adapted to these situations. I've seen how people have adapted to new technology. I've seen how a social upheaval may change the way that, that armies are built or wars are fought. Uh, this is a perspective that can be useful. But it requires an inquisitive mind, some critical thinking. You're going to have to prod uh, students throughout this thing to do some thinking about these subjects. Uh, some tough stuff here. I think you'll find, too, that what can happen is, and don't get frustrated, is you don't see direct responses from officers about, I could understand why this is important. I think, as one British officer once told me, he said, I know I've learned a great deal, but once I get back into the real world, I'll know what I picked up. As problems will begin to occur in the field, you have to address certain issues. You might find all of a sudden something you got out of your history course just pops up. It doesn't tell you exactly what to do, but it may give you a, a question to ask. It may make you look at things a little bit differently, raise more questions to others. And that's what it's all about, is to give you some more things in your mind bag to draw upon in your experience from others so that you can look at problems differently. You can be challenged in different ways and, and have some solutions that you otherwise would not have. Yeah. Uh, students tend to come to this, this business of military history, especially ones with a limited background, re recalling what they had in high school uh, and maybe some freshman uh, history in college. And, that, and in those is a requirement to remember some dates and some figures and, and some places and things like that. And you want to emphasize in this course that's, that's really not appropriate. If this is going to be a vehicle, uh, this course is going to be a vehicle for causing guys to do critical thinking about the profession. You, you don't want them uh, memorizing dates, names, places, stuff like that. You want them thinking critically about the profession. Now, uh, if they're going to make an argument in the classroom, it helps to know the specifics, the facts. If they come in there uninformed and shoot from the hip, you got to punish them for that, uh, you know, or challenge them at least in, in the classroom. But again. The, the, actual, the actual facts of history are not nearly as important as, as the, what you can learn from it, what you can, what you can use by thinking about it. Um, and again, this is a challenge because history looks like this, this enormous mac, mass of facts and, and occurrences. And, if, and if, if I come to you and I say, okay, you tell me military history is going to be useful for me. I see a record of thousands of years, hundreds, thousands of battles, the records of thousands of commanders. How do I make sense of this? How do I make it useful for me? I mean, what, what tools, what vehicle do I use to make all this great mass of, of experience useful in a way that I can, I can apply it given what I know? What do you think? Well, I was thinking, well, let me just say one thing before you uh, get into He's that. He's evading my question. Yeah, because one of the thoughts, too, that hit me is um, if you look at the way this course is designed, you might want to think, well, Sure, I can see value of learning from the past, but why don't we just focus on tactics, battles, uh, campaigns, what leaders do? Well, I think it's important to realize that uh, CGSC uh, is teaching officers at a point in career where they need to just not think about military matters purely. But we're training officers, educating officers to think along political, economic, social, and not just military lines. And what we're seeing in this course is we're trying to see how the profession of arms changes in the way business is done on the battle, how the battle has changed, how armies have changed, how the context in which they fight has changed, how the strategic environment has changed. Those are the things that are all interrelated as you go up the ladder in a military hierarchy. Somewhere in a military career, if you're going to go to the rank of major, lieutenant, colonel, you have to start looking along those lines. You're going to get that by just reading the paper today and talking about the interrelationship of military and non-military matters as they affect what's going on today. But in terms of how it affects the profession of arms and what wealth and experience you can learn from the past, we have to have a course like this that looks at the interrelationship of non-military and military matters as they change the profession, influencing how battles are fought, armies are organized, etc. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Now, come back to the question I asked you. How do you make all this massive stuff useful? Well, I think there are... Uh, there are analogies that can be made. If you look at the profession of arms, uh, there are certain basic issues that have to be dealt with. And training, organization of an army, how you lead in battle, how you motivate. 
as you look at some of the material from the past, you raise questions, draw parallels to today, and see what similarities and differences there are. It's never exactly the same. History is always changing. Keep in mind, history doesn't repeat itself. The only people who really repeat it are the historians. Because always, the people are different, the circumstances are different, the enemy is different, whatever. It's not exactly the same. But it, but, uh, it's that wealth of experience that you need. Uh, now, the question is uh, how to make it relevant. For example, if you look at Frederick the Great, what qualities of leadership did mm -hmm. he have that we can use mm -hmm. today? Mm -hmm. What were some of his strengths and weaknesses? Mm -hmm. As you look at him in battle, uh, it's pretty impressive how he wins outnumbered. What are the keys that he did in peacetime to get his army to perform better for him. What did he do in peacetime to make himself a better leader? Obviously, mm -hmm. there are some things in there that I know most officers are not doing today to make themselves better. You could, you could uh, draw from that and make it relevant to you and change how you do business. Because we'll see, he did some pretty amazing things for a king. What about theory? Theory, well, I think the way I look at it, uh, um, well, I, I'll give you my thoughts on that. Uh, okay. George, you were, is, you were <laughs> I, yeah, I was, I was setting you up a hand fall for it. Oh, well. um, one of the things we like to emphasize to students early in the course is, is that look at this great mass of sometimes unrelated facts. Uh, people through history have been struggling to put some structure to it and say, okay, there's some enduring things that I can pull out of all this great mass of facts that'll be useful for me. If I try to carry this great kit bag of names, dates, and places around, I'm going to be overwhelmed. But if I can, I can distill out of it some, some useful principles, some useful ideas, some, some things that reoccur, if I can, I can develop a body of knowledge that organizes and predicts, I may have something, and people have been struggling from that. Frederick himself is going to struggle with that. He, he, has, uh, he, he studies history extensively. He has his own experience in a series of wars, and eventually he's going to start distilling out of that some, some lessons that he'll be passing on to his generals. Uh, when the enemy captures that, they say, hey, we, we're starting to get the secret away. Frederick operates. We're getting into his head. But he is trying to give his generals the, uh, the benefit of, of his accumulated knowledge. He, he's, he's groping somewhere in between the area of theory and doctrine and simplify it for students. This is what I tell them. Uh, in, in the case of military history, uh, history itself is a record of what happens. Theory is, is our attempt as military people to give it some meaning. What does it mean? And then in turn, doctrine is, okay, if I decide this is what it means, this is what I'm going to do about it. Uh, an analogy you might draw is to a football team preparing for a football game. Uh, uh, a pro football team preparing for a football game will probably look at a whole uh, hours and hours of tapes on their opponent and their tendencies. What do they tend to do on third down and long? What defense do they use in a blitzing situation? And uh, who comes in as the nickelback? They, they, and they try to establish some trends, some tendencies about that. And, they, and they'll put that prob probably uh, on, on some charts. These are the tendencies of the way that that team tends to play given these situations. Okay, so the, the history piece of that is the game. Fills. The, the theory piece is this is how they act usually, uh, the tendencies. Then out of that, uh, those tendencies, you superimpose what, you know, what your strengths and weaknesses are. You come up with a game plan, which would be analogous to some extent, I think, to doctrine. Okay? Okay. History is the game film. Theory is, what does that teach me about this, the, my opponent? The doctrine piece is, what do I do about it? What do I, what I put in as a series of plays to handle the, the opponent that I'm facing this upcoming week? Uh, and you could make that case that each individual fits into that frame. We each, consciously or unconsciously, have a theory, a philosophy, if you will, about life, uh -huh. about how we fit in, yeah. how we raise kids. Yeah. We're attempting now here to make you reflect on the profession. Uh -huh. And theory is going to make you ask the more basic questions. Uh -huh. What is the profession about? What makes it tick? What is war? What are the in essential ingredients of war? What are the essential ingredients of leadership? Deepen your understanding about that because how you approach those basic issues, whether you've thought about them or not, you send messages to the people around you that you have some attitude, mm -hmm. some assumptions about the profession. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah, theory, theory is going to be a very important part of the course that we talk about. And we'll ask you within a few lessons to grapple with some of what we call the classical theorists, uh, the guys who come out of the Napoleonic Revolution, Clausewitz and Germany. These are the guys to this day still shape the way we think about military affairs. And you will find them either noted or, or plagiarized in, in our doctrine, our, our current 100-5, and the one that's coming out here in a matter of months. We'll be looking down the line at some other uh, important doctrinal thinkers. Um, one worth highlighting maybe is JFC Fuller, who gave us uh, a raw version of the principle of war we, we use today. Uh, but, but, but in mentioning JFC Fuller and the principles of war, it's worth mentioning that theory is something that's constantly changing, military theory. based You get new experience, that's inputs that cause you to reevaluate what are the enduring uh, lessons of our profession. We are going to come out with a new principles of operation to do 100-5. The guys who work upstairs in this building have decided, okay, our experience in the Gulf War, the new technology that's emerging, uh, the possible threats that we're facing, our experience in peacekeeping all suggest that we've got to reevaluate re the principles of war. They're not in, in, uh, engraved in stone. We're going to have to come back and reevaluate. That's the nature of all military theory. It's constantly, or should be, constantly reevaluating to say, oh, does this still reflect the best possible knowledge about our profession? In turn, as you reevaluate in theory, of course you're going to have to reevaluate doctrine periodically. And that's one of the reasons why we're rewriting our manuals every three or four years to reflect the, the new thinking. What you have in Frederick the Great, uh, here's a guy who changes his mind throughout his career about what's important, uh, how to fight wars. Uh, he's, a, he's, a, he's got a first class mind. He's, he's evolving theories, and you'll see the, the doctrine that he's putting out is his general the way he fights battles are going to evolve as he goes along, as he faces new circumstances, as he changes his mind about what's, what's important and what's not important. So again, come back to this history, theory, and doctrine. Um, one way to get at it, and it's covered a little bit in your instructor notes, is compared to the, the experience theory doctrine that, uh, or, that um, are, are used in other fields. For example, in the case of history, uh, Karl Marx and, and it looks at the history of mankind's uh, economic interaction said, hey, I can, I can pull some principles out of this, okay, uh, about class struggle and the nature of capitalism, all these things, to come up with a theory uh, about, about the way people interact economically and politically. From that, I'm going to come out with a manifesto that says, uh, a doctrine that says we as, as leaders of the underclasses are going to have to call for a world revolution, a world revolution that's inevitable according to my theory, mm -hmm. but it, it also drives a call for action as well. Um, and there's nothing wrong with theories needing to be adjusted or even thrown out. Sometimes they're useful in that regard. Oh, Galileo and Copernicus, exactly. for example. And that's the scientific world. We have what? Knowledge accumulating, theory comes to explain it, and after so many hundreds of years, we find that inadequate, and then comes the theory of relativity, and mm -hmm. it undoes it. Yeah. So there's nothing wrong with uh, theories changing, being adjusted, or even thrown out. They serve their usefulness. Yeah. yeah. And the bulk of what students are going to get in your reserve course are going to, is going to be doctrinal stuff. They ought to know, as a part of professional perspective, where that come from. Now, history and theory are not the only feeders into it. There are things like um, current threat assessment is going to feed the doctrine. The current political uh, situation is going to reflect the doctrine. The lessons that are coming out of the combat training centers will right. have an impact on doctrine. Emerging technology will have an impact on doctrine. The simulations that we're increasingly using in the military are going to have an effect on doctrine. But throughout history, uh, the experience and the theory have been the key feeders into the doctrine that armies end up using. Uh, and that's something, how you handle that, how much time you spend on that, you, you're going to have to uh, play that one by ear a little bit. Again, you have to get to the administrative stuff, but I believe, and you have to talk about the value of history. I think you want to spend a little time on, on the relationship of military history, theory, and doctrine. Great. Any thoughts on that? No? Well, um, the key figure, the central fi figure for this, this lesson is Avi uh, Old Fritz, Frederick the Great. Frederick II of Prussia, where does he come from, who, who is he, and, and what's the military background? And here's where I believe the instructor's got to carry a little bit of the load, maybe want to do a little outside reading. Where does this guy come from, and where does he fit in the evolution of modern warfare? I think we've got to start by kind of establishing a baseline of where he, the, the world that he lives in, the 18th century, and the kind of warfare that's, that's in existence when he comes on, on the scene. Any thoughts about that? 
that, George? Well, I, one concept that's used to capture what, what warfare is like is the concept of limited war. This is the age of limited war. And in what ways is war limited? If you look at societies, and here's where the, the political, economic, social factors really weigh heavily in how you fight. Mm -hmm. We're dealing with agrarian societies, mm -hmm. which means limited resources that can be used to maintain armies. Uh, limits on manpower, limits on the treasury. Therefore, you're not going to go for the gust of trying to conquer all of Europe. So it's an age of limited war, limited because of the economic system. It's also limited because uh, there are no great states in, in most of Europe. Uh, the big empires are the Ottomans, which are in the Balkans, and Russia, which is out east. Really, we have a lot of small s states in Central Europe. Uh, France, though uh, looks big on a map, is still rather inefficiently run. So we really don't have uh, large, powerful states with large, powerful armies that can project power far. So when warfare is fought, it's often for limited objectives, fighting over the terrain next to you, a province next to you, or a couple provinces down. We're not going to see, when we get to Napoleon, wars where you have armies marching to Russia and still fighting down in Spain. Mm -hmm. yeah, Again, without going too much in, you, you've got to establish a baseline for, for a course someplace. When we say down in modern warfare, the first question you might want to ask your students is, what is modern warfare? How can we characterize this, this period with powdered wigs and muskets as being modern warfare? And I'll give you some ideas, at least how, the, the things I pitch to my students. One is, um, they're all familiar with the Roman Empire. They know that under the weight of barbarian invasions and its own uh, its own internal contradictions, it collapses. For Europe, you have a period of the Dark Ages. You evolve into a medieval period, and they can all picture the knights and, and uh, the Round Table and all the things that come out of movies about that. Uh, for a long time. Uh, there's a power struggle. And this, a lot about what we're going to talk about is about a power struggle between uh, nobility and, and, and kings, or who's going to be the, the biggest dog. Uh, you know, and what determines the biggest dog is a lot, large part is taxation. This is where we get into the, the economic piece. And through the medieval period, you know, the, the nobility will offer their military services to, to a king, perhaps, or, or a higher level noble for, uh, for use in whatever wars he's fighting. The, the mounted knight is, is the picture perfect of a noble in, in his military role. Uh, and he offers his service to the king in return for various favors or, or land or what have you. That system starts to break down in, in the 13th, 14th, 15th century with appearance on the scene of guy, peop, uh, infantry. Uh, for a long time, again, the noble cavalry is the, the king of the battlefield, but infantry comes along. Swiss pikemen are, again, the picture we normally associate with an infantry that now can be, can be dominant on the battlefield. And so also the noble's position is challenged. And also, at the same time, he's, he's being challenged from below. He's also being challenged from above as kings start to, to gain a little more power. And in that, that power struggle for who's going to be the, the dominant political force, noble or king, uh, and who's going to have the power to tax us, in most of the modern states that we know about today, the king's going to win. France is, is probably the best example of that, the, the one that appears as the, as the big figure on the scene, uh, the first that approaches what we call a nation state. Um, in the, the last part of the 17th, first part of the 18th century, Louis XIV in France is able to put 400,000 men in the field uh, to fight his various dynastic wars with England and other powers in, in uh, or Austria, other powers in Europe. 400,000 men out of a population of about 20, 25 million. That is a staggering figure and, and history hasn't seen numbers like that before. What makes it possible? Well, a couple of things. Uh, one is he's won his bet. There's been a series of religious and, and, and civil wars in France where the king has emerged triumphant. He's, he's going to be the biggest dog. The, the no, nobility is going to be in second place. And they have to trade their powers of taxation for, for other perks, you know, political power, uh, rights to do local taxation, things like that. Um, Along with that, Louis XIV is, is one of the first to have a, a system of, of bureau, bureaucrats. Now, it's real inefficient and it's real Byzantine compared to modern standards, but by standards of Europe at that time, it's a pretty efficient system. He has a system of intendant guys who go around and, and inspect his army to hold it to a higher standard. And the armies, which had up that point been uh, 
largely composed of mercenaries, and again, the Swiss pikeman comes out as the example there of the, the, the typical soldier of the mercenary period. Well, Louis IV says, XIV says, I can do better than that. I can keep a standing army in place, and I got enough money now through my power of taxation that, that I don't have to disband my armies in between wars. I can keep the army in place. I can, uh, I can feed them, I can pay them, I can keep them in uniforms, I can drill them, and drill is, is one of the key ideas that's going to come out of this period, drill as, as a vehicle for building cohesion and discipline. Uh, I'm going to have a standing professional force, and that's going to be tremendously effective in the various wars I'm going to use. This is a new idea. You know, again, in, during the mercenary period, the idea was you raise the troops you need during wartime. Because they're expensive, you disband them as soon as the war is over. Well, what do these unemployed guys do? Well, they go around, ravage the countryside, burn, loot, pillage. You know, that's sort of, sort of their stock and trade. That's one of the reasons that made the Thirty Years' War so horrible, is these mercenary armies that really weren't under much control. They're only loosely affiliated with one side or another. And, and part of the limited war period that George talks about is a reaction to the horrors of the Thirty Years' War, which decimated and devastated large parts of Central Europe. Uh, I think you could draw on our own experience in our history why are our founding fathers, a lot of them, against the standing good army? Point. Because the standing army needs taxes. Taxes are collected by the government. The government grows, the army grows, and pretty soon the power of the government grows at the expense of the state. This is what is happening in Europe. The kings and monarchs are moving, some of them at least, the more efficient they are, the more they're becoming absolute in terms of all yeah. powerful, and yeah. they're able to maintain an army. So there are two important elements that emerged that are of a non-military, uh, well, one's military, one's non-military, that bring about what we call modern warfare. One is a growing centralized state with power at the center, able to collect taxes, and then a standing army. Now, what is a standing army? give you that you didn't have before. Well, as you get a standing army, it means you maintain it all year round. You've got to give it something to do in the off season. In the off season, you train it. As you're training it, pretty soon, eventually, standardization starts to come in. You're not just going to take mercenaries or, like we call upon the states. Each state has organized its militia a little bit differently. It's trained to a different level. You see that in National Guard today. So now you're able to, what, standardize, raise the level of training. Pretty soon, you start seeing schools emerge to train officers for uh, combat. It raises the level of performance. And less and less do you rely on free agents, and more and more you rely on your own people. Mm -hmm. that that not to mention the benefits of having a big army is now you can turn around and use them to coerce even more taxes out that's of right, people. That's it's right. A, it's a nice feedback loop is built in there. Yeah. That's why the founding fathers were against a well, standing indeed. army, because uh, once it started, you yeah. can't stop it. That's right. They be, you know, the recruiters come around, they start uh, billeting troops in your houses, and they start levying more taxes, and they, they start putting a squeeze on you, and, and who knows where it's going to end. You don't want them to nationalize your... Uh, yeah. Michael Howard has a, has a nice, nice little description of what has happened in these rise of, of standing professional armies responsive to a central political authority. He says, you go in Europe from a period where armies are, are kind of wolf packs out of control to, to the point by Frederick's time, he, he calls them um, well-trained hunting dogs or maybe even in some cases trained poodles. Um, but the armies are now under control, they're responsive to political authority, and that as much as anything uh, is why we think this, this lesson deserves to be called the beginning of modern warfare. Um, to me it's interesting because this happens in Europe. These trained standing professional forces, and they allow um, Europe by the end of this period, by the end of the 18th century, uh, it go, it, Europe goes from being a backwater of civilization to dominating a third of the world's land mass. And then when you, when you superimpose all these standing professional armies who are able to go out and dominate parts of Asia, large parts of Africa, large parts of North America, and then when the Industrial Revolution comes along and gives them even more firepower and even better means of transportation and communication, they go out and dominate two-thirds of the world's land mass uh, by the end of the 19th century. Something, something has gone on here, unique in Europe, that allows it to, be, to, to feel the dominant military forces in history. 
and uh, it's an important stuff for us to know. Uh, our military institutions, to, in a large part, come out of this period and come out of these, these first standing professional armies. We model a lot of what we do in our army after the British Army, which is very much a product of this period. It's worth, it's worth thinking about. You know, why is it a handful of British, British soldiers are able to go out and dominate the entire Indian subcontinent, large parts of Africa, take over all of North America? Uh, it's, it's what they've learned in the battlefields of Europe and places like uh, fighting alongside Frederick the Great, for example. And George Washington is smart enough to go out and get some free agents <laughs> to come over here and train his army. Well, and, indeed, von Steuben is, is a product of the Prussian system that we, that we talk about in this Frederick lesson. The first drill master of the U.S. Army is a guy who has learned in this school here of the, uh, the European way of war as it's established here in the 17th and 18th century. But in a large part, too, the, the limited war piece you talk about is reaction to the horrors of what has gone on before. Hey, Let's, let's, let's establish a war, war system where we, we limit the costs, limit the violence. Let's, this is, after all, intellectual terms. This is the age of reason. And uh, a war without bounds, a war of, of absolute violence is something we want to steer clear of. And this is another argument for having uh, limited war. And you don't want to overthrow your brother monarch because, after all, he rules like you do by divine right. And you start knocking off other kings, all of a sudden you've, you've challenged the whole basis for the system. So the wars this period, and especially uh, Frederick's wars, uh, are, are a case in point, tend to be a wars over a province here, a fortress here, a, a county here, but never about I'm going to march in the guy's capital and, and plant my flag on his palace. It's not about that. Uh, there were, were clearly defined limits. An ideal war in Frederick's time is a war where you can march an army through a province, friendly or enemy, and the civilians don't even know about it because you will provision that force, you will keep it under strict discipline, you'll keep the soldiers under control, and you may fight a battle, but you're, but you're going to avoid having the violence spill over like you did in the Thirty Years' War across the countryside. I think it's interesting, too, if you look at combat during this period to get a sense of how fragile these armies and states are. Good point. Uh, sieges take time, and they're the, the, the standard kind of battle that you have. But a lot of time in a siege is spent digging, getting ready to attack. But when you go to open battlefields, which are on the rarer side mm -hmm. compared to sieges, or less of them, mm -hmm. they're usually one-day affairs. Uh, part of the day is spent getting your forces organized to face each other. Then there's the shooting, uh, close range, 100 yards or less, lots of blood, lots of screaming. And then how do you tell who won? Well, sometimes the only way you can tell is who's left on the battlefield to pick up the yeah. loot. One side yeah. is retreating, the other side's disorganized mm -hmm. as well, except it's picking up the pieces. You don't have two, three, four day long battles, nothing like uh, at Verdun where it goes on for months. Uh, you cannot really, it's very difficult to have to pursuits because people are disorganized after battle. Everybody's tired. The, the expectation is to do the one battle, the winner gets to pick up the spoils, the, the one defeated withdraws, and then you fight to another day, but it takes time to heal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, and it's not going to bring tremendous political results. That kind of battle, it's not going to change the. No. the it, and it takes the let's say, it takes two years to train a soldier to fight in in the, the rigidly linear uh, tactics of the time. The, the complex drill, the uh, you know, what Frederick took the greatest pride in is how well drilled his army were. But it took two years to get a, bring a guy up to his standards of drill. A guy who could fire uh, two or three times a minute, maybe forty percent faster than his enemy, and could deploy from from column in the line rapidly. It took years and years to prepare this guy. If you take him out on the battlefield and you get a bunch of them killed off, there is a huge investment down the drain quickly. Uh, and every time you go into a battle with an enemy, you put, you throw in you're throwing yourself open to chance. Something could go wrong, you could lose the battle. And this is, the, the, to me, the attractiveness of the siege, especially uh, under a master like Vauban, who's the number one engineer of the period. If you put an enemy under siege, Vauban told you, if you tell me how big his walls are, how many cannon I have, uh, how many guys I have digging, I can tell you down to the day when that fort will, will uh, throw up a white flag. I can reduce it to a science. I can predict accurately when I will make the breach in the wall, the enemy will put the white flag up and he'll march out. 
okay, because you know, unless it's a civilized business, mm -hmm. uh, students may recall uh, that kind of stuff happening in uh, The Last of the most recent movie that talks right. about an 18th century style st siege. Once the breach had been made in the fort, the British uh, troops came out, the French, uh, the French commander offered them honors of war, and it looked like everything was going well. Of course, little did they know the Indians hadn't bought into all this European ideas about civilized conduct of warfare, but that's uh, you know, another story. You know in North America. But uh, monarchs and generals in this period tended to avoid uh, the, the open fight, the fighting in the open field. They much preferred to maneuver against each other, maneuver against each other's a line of communication, uh, especially because armies in this period tended to be tied to magazines or depots. And they rarely could get beyond about two or three, four days march beyond one of these depots before they had to establish another one. Uh, again, they don't want to send, send their guys out pillaging across the countryside like Napoleon is going to do later on to, to feed themselves, because in a lot of cases, these guys would just desert. I mean, it's only rigid discipline that's keeping these guys in the ranks. So he keeps these guys under strict control. He feeds them from these, these centralized depots, uh, and they become his vulnerability as well, and a limitation on, on the operational art, if you will, that, that commanders can practice in this period. And you'll see Frederick uh, coming to Cropper when he tries to violate that in 1744 when he goes into, into what we now call the Czech Republic. He doesn't have a good logistics system and loses half his men without fighting a battle. Mm -hmm. that's, that's typical of that age. Uh, you want to avoid that situation. Again, so it's economics, it's the social structure, it's the political structure, it's, it's the mindset of the time that makes us the, the age of limited warfare. Frederick's going to come along, he's going to play beyond, within those rules, occasionally he's going to try to play beyond them. And I think be, by the end of his career, you're going to see a guy, for all his genius, is still constrained by the limitations of the period. Still a product of his age. I, th I think very much so. What, else, what would you offer the students about Frederick as, as an intro, some thoughts about uh, well, well, let me just command me. Sure. Uh, in, t in terms of this lesson, I think uh, it's exciting to get into Frederick the Great and, and what makes him tick and why is he so successful. There may be some of the things we've talked about. You might consider, uh, there are several approaches. You can uh, try to get some discussion going about standing army, state, or some of the issues we, call, we talked about. Or summarize and set the stage for Frederick the Great. Take 10 minutes and just tell him what warfare was like, what the political system was like, what the economy was like, what made this a limited war, and they say, okay, now we've got someone out here who is going to be recognized the great in his time. For a person to be recognized by his peers, by his contemporaries, yeah. as great, is pretty yeah, significant. A good question is why? Why, why is he Why great? is he so great? Yeah. Does he have to bat a thousand on the battlefield, or couldn't he get, win the World Series with only a, well, what, 60% victories in the regular season? <laughs> okay? He has defeats, but he has victories, and the victories are pretty impressive. And the system that he has in the way he wins forces others to try to figure out what makes him tick, what is his army like, he becomes the model. He's like the West Coast offense now that has to be analyzed, looked at, and reacted to if you want to beat him. So he is changing to some degree the way the game is played on the battlefield. What makes him tick? Yeah. Well, if you look at his personal background, you might ask, is this a saga of child abuse <laughs> that he should have ended up you know, in some loony a house? for future leaders. <laughs> yeah. That's right. What are the strengths and weaknesses of his upbringing? Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah that piece by Lubas is going to give you a, a plenty to talk about. Uh, we in America tend to think that uh, that uh, you can you can make leaders. That everybody starts out uh, differently. And there are no. We tend to, to be a little skeptical, a little suspicious of genius, and we think probably that the the houses of Europe restricted the talent pool by limiting generalship to the nobility. In the case of supreme command, to the monarch himself. Well, in the case of Frederick. The, the, it doesn't look that way. It looked like uh, their system worked pretty well because you create the one great captain of the period uh, using uh, drawing from a very limited uh, gene pool, that is, of the House of Hohenzollern. And, and I like to talk with my students about, hey, where does Prussia come from and what are they about as, as kind of a start to this whole lesson? And why is it that Prussia later, this, it, this dirt poor little second rate. Um, uh, 
little country that uh, is the doormat of Europe. I mean, it, it's a speed bump for armies during the Thirty Years' War. Why does that arise a century later to become the, the dominant military system? And why does it rise later to, to lead all military innovation in the latter part of the 19th century? And why does it turn out to be such a formidable foe in, in, in a series of two world wars that we fight? Why are we constantly looking for them as a military example? Uh, I think that the point you make, too, which is interesting, uh, we have in, in, in our course uh, interview with a, a famous uh, German general from World War II and they ask him what made uh, Germany so successful on the battlefield in World War II. He says he thinks it evolves out of a military culture going all the way back to Frederick the Great. So what is going on with Frederick the Great will be improved upon later in the 19th century with the emergence of the general staff and Mokadia. Genius for war. Huh? Genius for war and then again we'll see it in World War I and World War II. We're seeing the development of a military culture that is going to change the way war is conducted. And it goes back to Frederick the Great for this professionalization. And he does some things that are important. Well, you, you point out an interesting modern analogy. Uh, George, again, is our Middle East expert. And he likes to point out, at least on the surface, some real parallels between modern day Israel and the Prussia of the 17th and 18th century. Here's a, a tiny country that doesn't have any real wealth of natural resources, surrounded by bigger, more densely populated na neighbors that have access to vast, much vaster resources, how does a nation in this situation survive? Well, you, you know what the answer is in the case of Israel. It develops the most efficient fighting machine in the region. Uh, that's, that has to be, it looks on the surface, that's the, that's the reason why Prussia survived. But again, if I've driven through the country several times, and I'm what was once Prussia, and I'm amazed at what poor farmland it is. It's got scrubby uh, pine forests, lots of lakes. I mean, this is a country without natural resources, and not particularly densely populated. And you wonder, how did these guys rise up to be mentioned in the same breath with the real great powers in Europe at that time, which are um, France, uh, Austria, the Austrian Empire, Russia, um, that's what you might, England at this point has become an important maritime empire, but it's not very, it's not big on the continent at this time. The Ottomans are, have been big up at this time, that's George, one of George's pet rocks there, the Ottoman Empire, though they may be on the fade by the time that, uh, that Frederick arrives on the scene. I think the one thing though you do get from the reading that's going to be important is you get a sense that the father of Frederick the Great is serious about his business of running the state and making sure his son is prepared to run the state. Mm -hmm. And to run the state, he just cannot be a king sitting in Versailles and, and having parties. He has to be very knowledgeable in the art of war. He forces him to learn from tutors. Th that suggests what? He appreciates the place of the military in Prussian society. Yeah. He leaves him with the fourth largest standing army in Europe, a good uh, military machine. The best drilled. And the the best, best organized, certainly. Yeah. Best organized. So he is going to force his son to learn from war veterans yeah. about combat. Not a nice school, not worrying about niceties like dancing and uh, going to parties and reading philosophy books, but to learn from the veterans. And what does a veteran tell you? Hey, you could read all the manuals that you want. I'm going to tell you what it's like out there in the field. That's what he's getting. Direct combat experiences of people who have fought, and, and that helps to shape his font of knowledge. Mm -hmm. Yeah. combat experience of others and his father does that I think that's an important element to help him later on yeah but it's not enough because what he wants to read he reads 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 studies eventually military history and he forces his officers to study history remember that one book memoirs mm -hmm. that deals with the nature of warfare, really. It's almost like a th you get a sense, not just a memoir, but a theory of warfare. What makes leadership? How do you get an army ready for battle? What is battle? Mm -hmm. So he's looking to something that is very useful for his officer corps, and it has a little bit of the theory in it, mm -hmm. and he is going to make sure that his officers underneath them get a good military education like he got so that they could be more competent. Mm -hmm. And I think he's ahead of his time in the seriousness he places on military education, the care he takes. It would be sort of like Reimer coming down to a school and saying, if education is important, I'm personally going to get involved, hand out degrees, look at the professional reading, list and make sure people are reading it and I have read it to start out with so I know it's good mm -hmm. that's an important model I think for senior leaders to see in a guy like a king 
mm -hmm. has to lead in battle. Frederick, in this case, is going to be different from a lot of yeah. monarchs yeah. in that he's a tactical commander, and his armies sometimes get whittled down to, what, 13,000 on a battlefield, which is much less than a division today. So we're not talking about a monarch who's at the senior level leadership of multi-corps over a huge front. He's really a tactical commander as well. Sees the battle as it unfolds and makes decisions during it. Mm -hmm. So that would make him useful to look at for people who are tactically oriented. Yeah. And for all this education, though, how does he do in his first experience on the battlefield as an independent commander? Not too good. Uh, he, he gets ridden off the battlefield. Unfortunately, the steady Prussian infantry, uh, the pride the, the pride of his father, is what saves the day, while Frederick is miles down the road, having been told to leave the battlefield, avoid the fiasco. Uh, Frederick's going to have to learn from the school of hard knocks, too. And how does he approach the learning, I think, to me, is kind of useful. Uh, how many times do we read memoirs of officers who have fought in battles, and it's hard to find mistakes that I have made. Good There's point. a tendency to explain away my mistakes. Frederick, if you read in that article, says, look at this guy Traun. In 1744, he gave me a hard time. I made mistakes, is basically what he's saying. Not only is he admitting to mistakes like someone does in Barbara Walters, an actor says, well, I'm vulnerable, but look at this other actor, he did really well. That, that's hard to, for a person to say. He's saying, look at this general, he gave me a hard time. Learn from him not from me. And that I think is an important thing about uh, any army. It's so easy to, what, sanitize the mistakes mm -hmm. that you make, mm -hmm. not embrace them, uh, sugarcoat them, and that's, I think, an important lesson we can learn today. It can be done. That's, that's well said. That's, that's well said. Yeah, and uh, for all his genius, though, I like to point out my students, he runs into an opponent that's going to give him fits. Uh, he comes to power and he sees, he wants to expand this little country he has. He wants to expand the tax base. He wants to get a little glory for himself on the battlefield. He wants to make the title of King of Prussia mean something in the courts of Europe. And he sees that, hey, this teenage female has just arisen to the, uh, the throne of uh, Austria-Hungary, Maria Theresa. You know, while they're in confusion being run by this weak female, I'm going to grab a province from Silesia. It's a rich province. It'll add lots to my, uh, my tax base, uh, my economic uh, stability, give me all these hard-working peasants that will uh, be useful for me in, in uh, building up my economic strength. So he goes there and tries to snatch it in 1740. Uh, as I tell my students, that you got to be careful which women you, you, uh, you anger. Uh, he was not a 90s kind of a guy, and uh, it, the results that he has to spend the next quarter century defending his ill-gotten gains in Silesia. He fights a, a series of wars against a woman who turns out to be a very capable administrator, a, a woman who inspires her, her subjects, and a woman who, who sponsors reforms in her army. And again, there's, there's the kind, you'll see this all through history. Uh, one military system will rise up, competitors will rise to meet it. War is the most, some people say, the most imitative uh, human act. And Frederick will be constantly facing facing new threats as, as his competitors start to get better. They start to learn from him in turn. Mm -hmm. uh, and this, this sort of sets the stage for the two battles that you'll talk about in this lesson, Rosbach and Leuten. Uh, during the, the Seven Years' War, Frederick faces arguably all the great land powers in Europe gang up on him you know, and through a series of uh, adroit political maneuvers by uh, Maria Theresa and her um, and her, her diplomats, they array Russia, Austria, France, and Sweden, all against Frederick at the same time. And by rights, if you just look at a correlation of forces, he's doomed. He's had it. You know, this, this young Prussian upstart is about to get, have his head handed to him. And somehow, somehow, throughout the Seven Years' War, he managed to stave off the disaster. Through a series of battlefield successes, some miracles, some other things, uh, in this war, and, and incidentally, and you'll see in your chronology, we call it the United States, the French and Indian War. It's, it's, some people call it the first modern world war because the fate of North America is decided. There's fighting down in the Indian sub subcontinent. Mm -hmm. There's fighting going on up and down the sea lanes around Europe. And then, of course, there's fighting going on all across Central Europe. Much of it on Frederick's Prussia. His country gets, uh, gets stumped on pretty bad as he's trying to defend it from these huge armies that are approaching from all four corners of the compass. He's in a rough situation. It's especially a rough situation in 1757 uh, when he's seeing a, a big French army approaching from the west, big, big Austrian army coming across the mountains from the south. The Russians are making noise on, on the uh, eastern frontier and Sweden is operating to the north of them. So he's, he's in a true trick bag. Uh, and that's, that sets the stage for these battles of Rosbach and Leuten. I think that those battles could be used uh, to analyze 
what is warfare like and also be used to look at what kind of leader is Frederick and mm -hmm. what kind of army does he have. If you notice in the reading uh, for Rossbach, he's able to pull camp mm -hmm. in what, 15 minutes to a half hour. It is amazing mm -hmm. the speed he does it. What does it tell you about the military of his time? Mm -hmm. That he has it better tra trained, better disciplined when things are working well than his opponents. The opponents think they've, he's taken to flight because he's left so quickly. And he leaves it kind of a little bit of a mess to give the feeling of he's in flight. So all of a sudden, there's the pursuit. Chase him, let's go after him. And the army strings itself out uh, too long and it's gonna be vulnerable to attack. But it tells you what, you could draw upon a little bit of information from a battle and ask him, what does this mean? Mm -hmm. 15 minutes, why is that impressive? It must be impressive for its time because it's done quickly. What does it tell you about the kind of military he has in comparison to the, yeah. to, to the uh, yeah. more disorganized army that's been used to looting on its way down, yeah. living off the well, land as it goes to face You bring Frederick. a key point up, and this, is, this doesn't come out in your readings. This is something I, I would ask instructors to highlight. The, the French army he faces at the Battle of Rosbach, for one thing, it's, it's not really a French army. There's a French contingent in it, but it's a, there's a lot of contingents from these little minor German states. And in a large part, they look a lot like the old mercenary armies instead of the modern professional well-drilled army. It's kind of a ragbag army. It's, it's an army that's kind of a throwback in some ways to, to the armies of the mercenary period. So what you see when Frederick, with Frederick's army is, is an army at the, at the peak of its efficiency, a thoroughly modern army, well drilled, well disciplined, well organized, and superb uh, subordinate leaders uh, like, like Frederick Seidlitz and his, and his brother there at the, at the battlefield. And then you see this ragbag collection, motley collection, you know, they're described as appearing on the battlefield with, with loaves of bread stuck on their bayonet and, the, and the, the French officers have their lady friends in tow as they appear and they're well perfumed, both men and women at this time as they appear on the battlefield. It is hardly a professional army the way we see it today. And uh, the result, in large part, is, is a rout. But, but what happens at Rosbach is in a way an anomaly. Uh, and it stands in real contrast to what goes on at Leuton uh, in that same year, 1757, when, when uh, Frederick has to face an Austrian army that has got the benefits of have, having already seen the Prussians in action and gone through a series of reforms to make itself better. And when they appear on the battlefield, they're gonna be quite a bit more formidable uh, than the, the ragbag uh, uh, army that uh, Frederick uh, defeats at Rosbach. Right. At, at Leuton, he's going to have to have a hard-fought fight. He's going to have to use all the tricks in his bag, and, and uh, at the end of the day, he's, he's going to be fortunate with uh, it, fighting it uh, about one to two odds or emerge triumphant. In large part, it's, it's his genius, his battlefield skill, his ability, his intuition about where to put troops and when to commit them. At the same time, I think it's, it's a real testimony to the steadiness of Prussian infantry, that the kind of steadiness of Prussian infantry that he inherits from his father. He owes a lot to his father uh, when it comes to the victories of this period. Any thoughts about yeah. that? Yeah, uh, and I mean, you can make a comparison because you mentioned uh, my interest in, with Israel. How can you win on the battlefield against your opponents? Uh, and Frederick's rifles aren't the best rifles compared to the opponents that he has. He has one thing working for him. He takes great care in training his troops. At one point, uh, I can't remember the year, he has the Spandau maneuvers. He puts 44,000 people in NTC training, two sides marching on the battlefield. His neighbors think he's going to war. So they start mobilizing their forces and they discover, no, it's just a training exercise. And they laugh at him, they ridicule him, like he's playing uh, uh, with his, he's looking at his soldiers, his toy, toy soldiers, toy yeah. soldiers and he's just marching them. Because when he was little, remember, he marched around little kids as a captain. His dad set him up that way. He takes time to train train his soldiers. He knows his battalions because he visits them. Mm -hmm. He takes care for the little things even though he's a senior commander. He's the king. And you'll find that a lot of your great commanders know the details, but they don't get bogged down by them. Mm -hmm. And in training them, he trains them that he hopes that he can get faster march out of them, and they do march at a faster pace, and gets more volume of fire because they're trained to, to shoot faster rate mm -hmm. than their opponents. So this gives him combat power mm -hmm. that his opponents do not have. And he could then do what? If you know you've got good troops, you can take risks yeah. with them, like he does. Yeah. And he's good at flank attacks, mm -hmm. marching to the flank yeah. to get his opponent, rather than a frontal assault, which tended to be more the rule. Yeah. 
He's got to because the numbers are against him. He is, uh, so we, we see him with these military innovations, whether it's a faster rate of fire, faster rate of march, a bleak order, uh, seeming to establish a new pillar of, mil uh, a new standard for military excellence in Europe. Uh, but at the end of the Seven Years' War, he finds that he can't keep on fighting these battles. We said that generals avoided battles during this period, and then we give you an example of a guy who goes out and looks for battle during wintertime when battles are normally not fought. So you, you got to, does Hedrick, Frederick fit into this period, or does he try to transcend it? Yeah, that's a question you might ask. Uh, at the end, I think, uh, with these being besieged at all sides, he's forced to fight into the box described by 18th century warfare. He may be the best general of the period, but uh, again, he has, to, he has to work within the limitations of the period. It's going to take a different kind of genius to go beyond the box in this case, to transcend the limitations of the period and bring on a new revolution in military affairs. And, that, and that's what we'll talk about when we get to a discussion of Napoleon in future lessons.